Welcome to Girl in the Gov, the podcast. Where our goal is to make politics more accessible and less intimidating. The show features an interview with an expert in the political field, walking us through the many cues we have about politics, civics, government, and more. By providing civic education in the places we are. On our phones. And in the language we speak. And yes, we know, we say like a lot. It's kind of the point. Because politics needed a rebrand. Welcome back to A Girl on the Gift of the Podcast, and welcome to one of the more political weeks that exist in the year. I mean, so many things happening. It's election day, we're recording this for myself here in California, for Samantha, and I'm excited to see what happens. From roll, please. No, it really is. It feels like I can't think of what this like you know like senior week in college where just everything is mayhem and it's like exciting and there's things happening and things moving that's what this feels like politically speaking it does it does and it has just a certain je ne sais quoi a certain energy to it because i think after this especially like let's let's be so fucking for real like trump is gonna like nab this nomination and i weirdly think that it's going to give people like a not a breath of fresh air, like a ability to be like, okay, we we now have officially moved into the next phase. And I think that will be that opening point for a lot of people, would be my opinion. Yep. I agree. I agree. And I think one of the biggest things to look out for from Super Tuesday, I mean, there's a ton, but I mean, I feel like this this Senate race in california the primary is huge because like typically the general we're gonna know who's gonna win that but it's gonna depend on who wins this primary i think this is a big one i feel like that's not just being in california yeah native is why i'm watching it but i think also politically it's it's gonna be interesting to see who comes out on top and especially interesting for like the democratic party because the candidates are pretty different so they are and they are all like Mainstays is not the word that I want to use. Legends is like too or like, like household names. Household names. That's perfect way to put it. Yeah, that's they all are for various reasons. So, which was like kind of my anxiety at the start of this whole rigmarole was like, do we really need all three of like <laughs> that you word? Guys? Really, just flows off the tongue. <laughs> <laughs> really does. I don't think I could say that word, but you said it. It flowed like water. Meanwhile, when I was trying to do our ad read last week for one of the partners that we work with, I had to do it literally upwards of 10 times because I couldn't say the word skeptical. So the fact that rigmarole, that one I've got, I can't. See? Guys, we are here for the rigmarole. But with this particular race, it just made me be a little bit like, guys, really, especially Katie Porter, as much as like I think very interesting candidate for senate Mm -hmm. like and i have various opinions on all of them and i'm not putting my hand in this pot of like i'm not a california voter and i'm just gonna stay out of it this ain't this ain't my fight okay but i think like her district is in particular like one that's been more republican so for her to like step out of like keeping that seat for the dems to go for the senate seat i thought was like particularly interesting I know. Well, technically, all of them will be if yeah. they win the because basically this the Senate race for those who aren't voting in California, we are voting twice for these senators because there is one person that needs to fill the rest of this term until January 2025 when people get sworn in. And then the long normal term of six years for whoever the next sitting senator is. So basically... Whoever wins that first chunk that's going to be for 2024 that will be in the in the seat will be giving up a House seat that is pretty valuable given the like really tight margin in the House of Republicans versus Democrats. So it's something to consider. But those are our options. They're all House members. So wait, I have a dumb question. Maybe this is this hits the map. So because you know how LaFonza Butler is currently like the the senator for like with that seat 
Mm -hmm. So is that not those instead of like a special election, they're making like the special election in part of 2024? Yeah. So this okay. is like the special election for the remaining of the term and then. And the remainder of the term and was the, in 2026. No, it's 2025. Like the normal when everyone else's term starts like after the main this general election they get sworn in january 2025 right which i think is okay. like why not just let lafonza butler like finish out the term instead of like putting a whole another person there but i don't make the rules so got it okay yeah it's weird i need a whiteboard there's a lot of weird things and your about primaries it. are weird too i was like trying to explain my, all, it to one of elections are weird like they're, they're just, so strange I also <laughs> know what I was talking to some peeps about, specifically my parental units, is I feel like this year the voter information has been a lot harder to find. Like, especially for local stuff, like, I, oh, I yeah. really feel like I've been having to dig and then still being confused by stuff. And then I think, hmm, well, if I'm confused by this and, like, this is, like, literally what I, like, do, mm -hmm. that's a problem. And yeah, so I opened my ballot and immediately felt intimidated. Well, the other very political thing that is happening this week, amongst just, like, other news with, like, Kristen yeah. Sinema jumping out of the Senate race, who knows what she's about to do because I am um, so curious. there's no labels chirping and chattering, so. Oh. But you, you know what? Know. The thing is, is I feel like she is disliked across the board. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I haven't asked a Republican that in a while. Like, obviously, no, I have her and Mitch McConnell. believing that Republicans will vote for a former, a former Democrat. Democrat that's just like so establishment. I don't see the appeal in her, but yeah, I agree. Yeah, I but I am curious. I think to me, the whatever the nail in the coffin for her was her BFF Mitch McConnell retiring because during his speech, she cried. Oh, God, she is she had some tears. They did a little hug. She's Lucifer's little handmaid. So the other very political thing happening this week is the State of the Union, which Samantha is in D.C. to do some so to things. Our girl's going to the White House tomorrow, which is so <laughs> exciting, a.k.a. today when you're listening to this. Oh, yeah. I would need to hear about this itinerary. It's it's pretty crazy. We're not going to the White House for the first time together, but that will happen one day. You know, logistics are hard and admin's hard. And I had some Three travel week. conflicts. Get me started. So unfortunately, I won't be attending, but we will be cheering Samantha on at, at the old White House tomorrow. And I'm going to be live tweeting it to Maddie, like bit by bit. So mm -hmm. it's going to be as if she's there and just not being forced to take pictures of me. Yeah. Yeah. So. It's probably a blessing for me, actually. <laughs> 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 Meanwhile, I'm going to be having 10 anxiety attacks because I'm going to be like, I need someone to take a picture of me. And I don't know who's going to be there. So I don't know if I know anyone yet, which is always yeah. like. I feel like normally, like, in a memory, you don't know anyone, like, depending on what it is, not crazy, but, like, one where you're, like, also, like, a content creator, and you also are just being at the White House. Like, even if I, like, literally got nothing for our TikTok or anything, if I, like, the goal is to get a hot picture of me at the White House. Like, let's be so fucking for real. Like, I yeah. just, whatever. I think so, that like, should what be priority I... number one. Thank you. See, this yeah. is why we're friends. But nonetheless, it's... Well, what is the be... itinerary for the White House tomorrow? Do you know? Or are you just going to show up and see all the hot Secret Service men? Which, by the way, when that happens and when you're going through those gates, mm -hmm. think of me. And potentially pass around my number, please. Me I'm first. Serious. But no, literally. <gasps> okay, You know they're more my like... type. You can go for the nerds in the White House. I want the social social security. Am I okay? <laughs> Secret Service. I want the Secret Service boys out outside. Out Wait, it's fair. But I'll work on this. This is this is a big undertaking. But well, I have like thought about like what if I'm just like starstruck and I like can't get through security because I'm just like mesmerized. You know what I mean? Like these have been the things that have like come across my desk in my mind. And we're gonna see. There is an itinerary. It's, like, very, like, vague vibes at the moment, but a different, a few different, what is the word that I'm looking for? Segments of the calendar, the event, have, like, different speakers, and that's really, like, all I know. Is it, so, like, a t do you get a tour, or are you just, like, going into a room and they're bringing people in to speak to you? When I tell you, I have literally zero clue. Like, I think I honestly have a better understanding of, like, 
the surface of Mars than I do as to like what what's going to happen. Okay. So obviously we'll get a full debrief. Like we'll go like line by line, moment by moment, all of the things. But I really don't know. Which again, my goal is probably not their goal. Their goal is to tell me good things about the state of the union and for me to bring that to you guys. To you all. I yeah. am focused on getting a hot, amazing outfit photo at the White House. As you should. As you should. Thank you. Thank you. Well, speaking of so too, that is what our episode is really about today, which mm-hmm. is so timely and perfect. Just like, that's just who we are. That's what we do here. Quickly, a quick admin moment, which I'm also informing Samantha on right now. I will be traveling on Tuesday next week, which will delay our episode a little bit. So just a heads up, I think we'll have the episode come out Wednesday night, Thursday morning next week. Gorgeous, beautiful, perfection, amazing, all of the things. Side note, I might be hanging with the Secret Service guys, but Maddie's going to South by Southwest. I'm going South by Southwest. Just like literally, like think of like the hot Texas guys with their little hats. I know. Oh, I'm dudes. like kind of like, manifesting really, that I meet my husband there. I, I could totally see it. I just feel like the vibes are vibing. Mm-hmm. I've really, really been like craving, not that I have so much experience in the South at all, but like a South trip, but like a like warm environment, warm lifestyle vibe, just really been calling my name. That's what March does. You know, it, it really makes you yearn for warmth in the summertime. It's like everyone's just so topped out of coldness. I saw a flower um, today and I'm going to start crying, okay? <laughs> a flower. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's just been straight rain here for me for like over a week. So I'm ready to feel some Texas heat. Not that it's going to be that hot, but it'll be nice. 70s, high 70s, which will be nice. that's my perfect sweet spot. Um, yeah. And I'll have probably a lot to debrief from that trip as well. Lots of political things happening. So tune in next week. A little bit late, but it will be, be so worth it. In your it's going to be like the debrief yeah. episode. Okay. Right. Getting well, back let's get into this ADD. episode. Yes. Well, you introduce our guest, please. Okay. So, like we said, we're talking about the State of the Union, which, you know, I would say what it is, but we do define this on the episode. This is one of the first questions. So, yeah. keep, keep listening. Keep tuning in. I don't know what my typey hands are if you're tuning in on YouTube or for, but it just felt right. So, go with it. Anyways, this episode is with Poppy McDonald, who is the president of USA Facts. You guys may have seen us sharing lots of USA Facts stuff both in our newsletters on social they have like really amazing graphics and explainers and literally just the facts it's totally nonpartisan. this particular deep dive is on their state of the union report so looking at those big categories of topics that get covered in the state of the union from the economy to immigration and so on and how to sort of watch the state of the union what to take from it what to take from also the rebuttals also the report which i'll also link in the description am i missing anything Wow. And there it is. That is, there she goes as the song goes. You want to the song? There she goes, like the classic rom com. Yeah. 2007, there of course. There she goes. I'm so joking. <laughs> Anywho, without further ado, here's Poppy. Wow. Look at me. <laughs> All right, Poppy, we are so excited to have you on Girl on the Go, the podcast. You're the president of USA Facts, which if you're listening to this show, by the way, and you haven't seen us post all the awesome graphics and stats and all the things from USA Facts, I don't know what you're doing. But Mm -hmm. for those that have it, maybe they're new, they're just rolling into Girl on the Go, the podcast and what we post and, and all those things. Can you give us the background on USA Facts and what you guys do? Absolutely. And thank you for posting what we do because we are so appreciative and big fans of your show and the work that you do. So Dan Garling back at you. And we at USA Facts, uh, we basically make government data accessible to the public. So our mission is to empower Americans with the facts. And we do that by making the data about how what's happening in our country accessible and understandable to people who are wondering 
is, is my country headed in the right direction? Right. How are things going? And they want data and numbers to back that up so that they can feel confident in how they're understanding their lived experience. And so we were founded in 2017. Steve Ballmer is our founder and funder. And basically the history there is he left as CEO of Microsoft and he wanted to do more from a philanthropic perspective to help lift people out of poverty. And being a data guy, right, he used numbers mm -hmm. every single day at Microsoft to make business decisions. He said, well, before I just go in and throw money at the problem, I want to understand what are the government programs that exist and right. are they working? And so he grabbed a couple of people from the, the Microsoft finance team and said, um, hey, go get the numbers. And they're like, sure, two weeks, like parting gift. <laughs> and six months later, they were finally able to pull together the data about what of the revenues coming in from the government, which of those were going to uh, fight poverty, and um, what were the outcomes. And he said, this is insane. Like, it shouldn't take six months to pull this data. So if I'm having this hard of a time, how hard must it be for a voter who's trying to make sense of their country let alone even a lawmaker, mm -hmm. right? They right. don't have, I worked in, on Capitol Hill, like they have very small teams. So this, it shouldn't be this hard. This is the people's data. It should be accessible to the public. And he really felt yeah. like this was a big gap and one that we could fill. Totally. And yeah. gatekeeping data, not the vibe, which <laughs> definitely feels like it's been that way, or at least when in the past, pre you guys existing, it really takes a deep dive. You have to even know where to look or where to Google or where to, you know, sort of go down a rabbit hole in the first place, which. Yeah, we say we have that? that problem all the time, too. And we consider ourselves like, you know, experts in the field, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, Real experts. I was gonna say, no, we, it, have, we have total empathy. Sorry to interrupt you, Maddie. We have total empathy when it comes to it does feel like gatekeeping. And we understand for a federal agency like Department of Housing and Urban Development, their mission is make affordable housing available to the public. Their mission isn't make data accessible to the public. Mm -hmm. And so we understand why with their the resources that they have, um, making that data accessible may not be kind of top of their list. They're, they're looking at a different mission. And we think it's really important for People wonder in this country, like housing doesn't feel affordable. What is happening with housing? And like that data is really important to helping mm -hmm. answer that question. And it's going to really depend right on on where you live and how much money you make. And so we're trying to really bring that comprehensive data together. And that looks at like going to multiple agencies to pull that data. Right. Yeah. Data is crucial. We love data. Um, and we also know you are... You have a thorough background in the media space, the political media space. And so in this day and age, why do you think, you know, USA Facts and the mission behind it is is so critical? Like what's what's that snapshot look like? Yes, I come from media. So I know the importance of information in terms of creating transparency about what's happening in the government. I also know coming from media that data isn't generally part of that story because Reporters are trying to work at a frenetic pace to break the news, to get the information out to the people as quickly as possible. And if data is hard to get access to, it's just not going to be part of the story. And I think it's a really important part of the story, right? Your part of that investigation is talking to people and getting their opinions. You usually get a lot of, of adjectives with those opinions and you usually get conflicting opinions, right? And so someone's going to read the story and say, I'm confused, right? This this expert thinks this, but this expert thinks something completely different. And we think grounding in data, one source of, of facts, is really important to clarify and help people understand that story like by the numbers. And then you decide, do you agree with that expert, don't you? And we we understand that reporters, people in Congress, voters aren't going to leverage that data to make a decision if it's not really easy to get access to. So when I got the call to say, would you be interested in coming in, moving to Seattle and working for a not-for-profit? And I'm like, what is it? And it, they <laughs> said, it's making government data accessible to the public. And I thought, wow, that is a differentiated value proposition. I don't know of anyone who does that. And I can really see the value 
from when I was working on Capitol Hill, from when I was working in media, and as a as a citizen, and for family members, right, who are really confused and are, are asking me questions about like, are, is this true? To make that data uh, accessible and understandable. Totally, and I feel like especially now, I mean, our country just has felt more polarized than ever, and those conversations amongst people that you disagree with just seem harder and harder. And part of that is because so much of it is rooted in opinion, which opinions matter for sure. You know, everyone has their experience, their perspective, but like having a source where you can actually bring it back to a fact and be like, okay, this is actually the way the economy is going. Like, this is what growth looked like here. And this is not what the crime rate is actually like looking at the data, I think is so helpful. And I know one of the reports that you guys do involves the state of the union, this casual little address that happens <laughs> from time to time, you know, just one of those little things. But I want to know, you know, for especially those that are like, what is that though? As much as I joke about what the state of the union is, what is the state of the union and why is this report that you guys do so important? Yeah, the state of the union is this annual address that the president delivers to Congress. It's required by the constitution that the president will give an update about the country to Congress and it happens, it's happened annually since George Washington. And it is a chance for the president to give an update on like, how is our country doing? And as we went and looked at State of the Union's addresses across time from both political parties, we noticed something in common, which was generally that the State of the Union was described as strong, stronger, never been stronger. Mm-hmm. And yeah. that is understandable that the the person leading the country wants to present a positive picture. We felt it was a little more complicated than that. And really to understand how our country is doing, you've got to look at the numbers and you've got to take it topic by topic. And we felt as as a, a citizen is listening to the State of the Union, as a member of Congress is listening to it, uh, they should have the numbers about how our, is our country doing, what's happening with our economy over time. What's happening with immigration? What's happening with uh, health care and access to health care? What's the state of our middle class? That being able to see those numbers next to the, the address and to dive in a little bit more and have those facts would be very helpful. Um, and so we have been uh, producing a, a state of the union in numbers. It's digital. It's at usafacts.org. Um, And you can dive deep into a particular topic. You can read just a high-level overview of of how our country is doing by the numbers. They're interactive data visualizations. It's um, pretty simple. We've got, you know, six bullet points per topic, but we really try to create that high-level picture and then let let you dive as deep as you want. And it's something that we do in in service of our country. Yeah, that's so interesting. And I've definitely utilized that in the past as well when watching I'm super curious what like the prep is like on that or or how it functions on your guys's end. Like, is it prepping everything? Do you know what do you have the speech beforehand that you can go through and like have time to prep? Or are you like in real time just like going through everything and finding finding all the facts and the fact checks? Yeah, it's a great question. So the State of the Union in numbers is up now for for this year, for 2024. So it's got all the latest data compiled. We wish the president leaked us the speech in his hands. We don't quite get <laughs> that. <laughs> but what, what we have done is we've gone back and analyzed prior State of the Union addresses and said, what are the topics that are typically covered? And then we ensure that we're pulling the latest data on those issues. And in some cases, we have 2023 data. Um, in some cases, like in the case of uh, the estimate of illegal immigrants, our country hasn't, that are illegal immigrants in this country or people who are here illegally, our country hasn't updated that number since 2018. So when we say latest available, sometimes it's it's quite dated mm-hmm. and it's not That's because our team wasn't doing their homework or they're like, right. meh, let's mm-hmm. not refresh the data this year. <laughs> yeah. We don't have time. We get the latest available um, and then we analyze it um, just simply to say, you know, what are the numbers saying? We're nonpartisan. Um, we don't take a side on any issue. So it's just literally sharing that here is where we are by the numbers. Here's what's changed. And then we create data visualizations to help uh, show change over time or to compare different demographics in our country in terms of their experience, um, whether that's breaking out uh, different income levels or, or breaking it out by race or by age. Um, and so that's it's up 
currently at our site, usafax.org. Right on the front page, you'll see State of the Union and numbers. And uh, we definitely encourage your listeners to go in and uh, take a look. Totally. And speaking of that report and like what's in there, crime has been one of those conversations. I feel like, honestly, this is not the first state of the union where this has been a centerpiece. It seems to always work its way back into the conversation. Definitely a right versus left conversation also always going on. And so I'm curious, like bringing it down to the actual facts of the matter, like what is the rate of crime in the U.S.? Like, are we really a need to be you know, horns blaring and freaking out? Or like, is this Mm. just a lot of people yapping away and, you know, pushing conspiracy theories? Yeah, great question. I mean, you hear people say like, oh, crime and crime is out of control. And um, there was the, you know, we looked ourselves at things like the the rise in in auto thefts and what was happening with Kias and, and the TikTok trend, right? So we went and looked at the data on that. So you hear things, right, that get you scared or you hear about particular crimes. I mean, Overall, the kind of interesting, there is no like official crime rate statistic. We re- really what our when we collect the data or not USA Vex, but when the, the government collects the data, um, they break it down by type of crime. And so it's it's mm-hmm. a different story based on what type of crime and then where you live. Obviously, yeah. um, if there's not a national statistic is probably not going to give you as clear of a picture as like, but what, what's crime like in my neighborhood? What's crime mm-hmm. like in my city? So for the violent crime, uh, if you look at that, it actually, it fell. And the latest available data we have is 2022. And so for the second consecutive year, violent crime uh, was down. Um, and it was down uh, to about, well, 380.7 violent crimes per 100,000 people. And so that's going down. If you look at property crime, that increased. So again, it's a, it's a different story depending on what stat you're looking at. And it increased in 2022 for the first time. And so it it was up slightly. And if you look at things like, you know, white collar, other crimes like white collar crimes or what they call victimless crimes, that that's people who are arrested uh, because of with personal drug use or for other drug offenses. Um, that you know you can those statistics are are collected separately so it really it really varies in terms of your age in terms of your demographic in terms of where you're located in the country so we definitely encourage people to come to usafacts.org and really dig in to crime rate where where they live because we know that's what impacts the most but yes just the the generalization about like you know, mm-hmm. crime rates, mm-hmm. crime is terrible. Crime is overtaking <laughs> our country. Like that, that doesn't really give an accurate picture. But yeah, if you're talking about property crime, yep, that is up. If you're talking about violent crime, it's down. Yeah. That is so it's, interesting. Yeah. Like, I crazy. just, how just black and white things turn, you know, politically. Mm-hmm. And so that's why I think these numbers are so crucial because, again, it's just like immigration's like wall or no wall, economy's doing good or bad. It's like there's so many different factors. And it's just unfortunate the way like politics has to communicate it to the public in such a such a black and white way. It's it's again so nuanced and and there's so many different details to dive into. But another again, another issue that's like that is the economy. And so, and we know probably Biden is going to be talking about this in a lot. So what does your guys' data currently show about the state of the economy? Yes. Um so People are having their own experience with like, do I feel economically right. like I'm doing better or worse? So mm-hmm. they're probably going to start there. But overall, if you look at the U.S. economy by the numbers, GDP is increasing and it's increasing for the third year in a row. And unemployment is back to it, nearly back to its pre-pandemic levels. So there was it obviously rose during the pandemic, but people are, are getting employed again. And wages were up. So wages were up 4%. But we always look at, okay, but what about inflation? Because Mm -hmm. sure, you can be making more money, but if things cost more, well, the impact to you could not not be much. So when we look at adjusted for inflation, wages are up about 1%. And so, you know, looking at that, people can look at those numbers and say, okay, that's what's happening with the country. And then obviously they need to take into perspective, like, what's happening in their their own lives and with their own experiences. And we certainly uh, give you the opportunity 
at usfx.org to look at um, what's happening uh, with wages, either looking at, for example, like looking at it by income levels. So we look at people talk about the middle class. Well, what is the middle class? You can read mm-hmm. a New York Times article and they're interviewing people who make $100,000. Um, we don't we think the best way to look at the middle class is literally to break down the country into uh, to segments and look at the middle 20 percent of the country and understand what's their experience, what's happening with their wages are they paying more or less in taxes? What sort of benefits are they, we call them transfers, transfers from the government. So that could look like things like housing assistance, uh, like a, a mortgage credit. So also look at, you know, I'd give a chance to see like, where do you fall uh, within the bands in terms of, of your income and the experience that you're having? Oh, that's really interesting. Because again, it's like we see poll after poll of people like being unhappy with the economy. It's so personal to each person. Yeah. I And I, to add to that too, it's, I, I think so much of it is like regional, like where you live, like you live in New Jersey, for example, like your property taxes are insane, like absolutely insane. So even if you're doing well by all the other numbers of and targets that are calculated, you can be like, yeah, but like I'm paying $30,000 a year in property taxes. So any gain in wages I made is out the door, you know? So I think it's interesting because it like especially at least shows that baseline to think of things wrong, which I feel like people kind of like lose that focus. Like, wait, what should that baseline be? So I think this data is really helpful. And I'm curious from a feedback perspective, what you guys have heard from people on the economy. Like when you guys are posting something or sharing something, like what has been that feedback from consumers? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. I, I, you know, when we post about the economy or many topics, we t- have people tend to personally engage with like, well, that is not my experience or that mm-hmm. is my experience mm-hmm. exactly. Yep. Um, and so we have noticed people want a more sort of personalized look at like, OK, but what about where I live or how do I compare to other people in the country? Um, and when we are we're up on uh, Capitol Hill talking to members of Congress, one of the things we heard was like, hey, our constituents say it feels like it's harder to buy the things I used to be able to buy. Like it feels like my money doesn't go as far. Mm-hmm. And we want to know by the numbers, like, is that true or is that not true? And so we we have looked at and there is in the State of the Union, we have a section called how is the American middle class doing? What support does the government provide to the people? And, you know, we do look at how has the middle class income changed and in market income in terms of like the wages and salaries that people in the middle class receive, they are they're making when you adjust for inflation, they're making less than they did. Um, However, when you look at um, you account for taxes, they're paying less in taxes than they had 20 years ago and they're receiving more transfers, more benef- more benefits, like the earned income child tax credit from the government than they had previously. So overall, the middle class is is doing better, but not based on the the market wages that they're making. It's really right. based on paying less taxes and then government benefit transfers. And so I think that would confirm, you know, some of the the feedback or some of the feelings people have. In terms of like, hmm, I feel like my maybe my paycheck isn't stretching as far. But then when you look at that comprehensive picture, that can give you a sense of like how are things changing over time. Totally. Yeah. I almost I wish that everyone oh. got like, sorry, a personalized receipt at the end of the year, like an easy to read, not your yeah. tax returns, which like God help us all. They just H and R Block like have our backs. Like that's all I can <laughs> even say about that. But like to have like really like you know a, a report a personalized like USA Facts report on like okay like really where did everything land for someone personally? I just feel like it would be so helpful and like help communicate that. So just throwing that idea out there. But Maddie, what were you? I gonna love say? that <laughs> there are countries that do that, and I want to say it's the I want to say it's either Australia or the UK. But there was a Reddit thread about someone saying exactly that, Sammy. Like, I just wish that we could get an accounting of like, where are these, where are my tax dollars going? Yeah. And someone said like, USA Vax should do that. And like, here's an example of, I think it was Australia, of a country that does that. And it's just, obviously it's giving you, it's looking at, okay, where of the revenues collected, 
where do they generally go and into what programs? But then it just gives you, okay, based on this much you pay and taking percentiles, here's what your report card looks like. So it's certainly something we've thought about doing. It would require people, you know, sharing their income, like sharing what they paid in taxes or even sharing like their income so that we could, you know, make an approximation. And we're not sure how comfortable people feel sharing that data. It's nothing we would keep or hold on to, but it's something we think would be um, really fun to do. So I I love that idea. We should see if there's a state that would like pilot it to like legislatively as like a something that a state takes on. Um, Well, no, yeah. My question was also just about the middle class. And if you guys have like um, a breakdown of what you consider the middle class, I also just heard a lot of voters like truly not know what that means anymore. I think there's like just a lot of misunderstanding around like what the middle class is. Like, am I in it? I don't know. Like, what do you guys determine that by? Yeah. So we break it into quintiles. So we look at the the top the bottom 20%, the second 20%, and then the middle 20%, um, the fourth 20%, and then the top 20%. So I know that feels totally confusing. <laughs> we also break out the top 1% because the wealth and the income that they're experiencing is is very different than than the other the other segments. And so we look and say, okay, for that middle 20%, which we would call the middle class, but they're the middle of the country, what is their experience? So, you know, on our site, I see we look at, okay, how much are they uh, paying in taxes? How much are they receiving in transfers from the government? You can also look at what is the average salary of that middle class. And it's it's not popping out for me here for the latest year, but I know the last time we looked at it, it's around $59,000, which I think really surprises people. And, you know, I just was going to give a talk and I was, I asked my Uber driver, you know, we started talking and I said, you know, well, you'd probably have a good sense of this. What do you think the the middle class salary is in this country? And he was like, I don't know, like $110,000. And yeah. so I think it surprises people no matter what income they come from to see here mm-hmm. that like the middle class, which is a, a family or person filing as a household with the IRS. So that could look like one person who lives alone, or that could look like a a family living together. But on average, that middle 20% of households, their their total annual income is about $59,000. Yeah, which again, yeah, it also depends on where you live. You say you live in Seattle. So it's like, (laughs) yeah, it's like depends on where you live because- yeah, that wouldn't fly here in San Francisco and not New York. Yeah. And so it's just, yeah, it's interesting also seeing those like average numbers nationally. Totally. Which I guess is also the classic of an average too, is like you are, if there's anything I'm going to pull from my math brain, which is barely existent, we all know right. this, but like, <laughs> you know, when you do have the extremes of both ends, like it really does, it can sort of pull it into one direction a little bit more so, but I am curious to this larger conversation about looking like city by city or like state by state. Like, is there any data that you guys do in terms of like middle class per an area, like how that might change, like what a middle class number might be in New York City versus middle class number in like Kansas City, like that sort of comparison? That's a that's something we would love to do. I mean, one of my goals when I joined the organization five and a half years ago and Steve said to me, like, I built this thing. I want more people to use it. So, like, I want it to be more, yeah, leveraged by by people mm-hmm. that I, I built it for the benefit of the public, not for myself. And I said, you know, one of the things I really felt was important was uh, more data. And I said, I think this really becomes relevant when it's rather than my country or even my state, it's my school, my neighborhood. You know, am I safe in crime in my, where I live, what's traffic like, what's, what are the road conditions when I'm making my commute? So I think we have to get it really local. We are right now collecting data from nearly 100 sources, and those are pretty disparate sources. So when you're collecting data from the Department of Transportation versus Housing and Urban Development uh, versus the IRS, um, they, there are no standards in this country about how data is collected, when it's collected, or or how it's reported. 
And so sometimes it may look like um, a great API, which is like a, a feed of data that's uh, fairly easy for us to get access to. Sometimes it can look like a PDF document that we're having to scrape that information off of. Sometimes it looks like a, the IRS was sending us data on a CD. So <laughs> it is a lift. You know, someone might say like a hundred sources. Wow, you know, I'm a, you know, as a company, they may have thought that sounded pretty simple. It's pretty difficult to get the data and then to standardize it and normalize it so that you can take something like household income from the IRS and compare that to demographics that are coming from the census and compare that to housing data. And I think the other thing that's kind of mind blowing for me is like those hundred sources are coming from the, the federal government mostly now, which is a would be one of the 90,000 governments that exist or the government entities that exist in the United States of America. So we're 100 sources at one. There are probably about 121 data sources in the federal government. And we've still got another, you know, 89,999 to go to get that comprehensive local picture, which is like mind blowing. And so um, while we are nonpartisan and we don't advocate for any particular issue, we just say, Start with the start with the numbers. Let's agree on the numbers. And then we know people are going to have a hearty disagreement about how we change those numbers. What yeah. we do advocate for is open, transparent, public data. And we know we can't get there until there is some standardization. So, you know, open data to the public is something that we think is really important. Yeah, totally. Well, another big state of the union topic is going to be immigration. It's really been the hot button topic of 2024 politically. So curious the status when your guys is end on immigration numbers for this year versus past years. Yeah, we'll start there. I have some thoughts <laughs> probably. Yeah. So there's, you know, authorized immigration and then there's unauthorized immigration. So there the authorized immigration would be people who are applying for green cards or non-tourist visas or are granted refugee or asylee status. So they're the kind of, we certainly track, okay, what's happening with authorized immigration to the U.S.? And that did rebound in, in 2022. There was, a, there was a decline in authorized immigration during COVID, um, but it picked back up in 2022 after declining almost 50% in 2020. And so there were nearly 2.6 million people, and that number can feel too big to really understand, but think about it as like the population of Chicago um, who legally okay. immigrated to the U.S. in 2022. Um, and that exceeded the number of people who had entered legally between the time period of 2018 to 2021. But it was slightly below the number of people who were who were authorized immigrants in 2016. So we're still not above where we have been previously. It was 2.7 million in 2016. And 2016, I'm sorry, 2.6 million people in 2022. So just to give you a sense of, of what's yeah. happening there. So and then, you know, we could talk about other, you know, types of immigration as well. If that, that's helpful. Yeah. I mean, I have a question about just like if you guys get any numbers around border crossings and legal yeah. immigration. I think obviously that's the political conversation that will be talked about in the State of the Union and that, again, gets politicized so much. I know you mentioned like immigration numbers. You guys, it's like nobody's gathering them or like, I don't know. Yes. What, I forgot what you said about that, but definitely curious because yeah. it feels like it's like, is are those illegal border crossings, are those like anecdotal of people being like, I'm seeing all these people or are there actual hard numbers to back it up? So there are the people who are apprehended and that data is collected. And then there are people who may cross that we don't we don't know about. Right. Um, and so we do know that there were a record high number of migrants that attempted to cross into the U.S. Uh, or attempted to cross the U.S. border in 2022. So we we are we are tracking those numbers, and those are people who have been apprehended. But the actual number of well, how many unauthorized uh, people are living in this country? That is fuzzier, that number. So the federal government used to do an estimate of that, and they estimated 11.4 million unauthorized immigrants were in the country in 2018. And 
that number has not been updated since 2018. So we are trying to talk about in 2024, our perceptions about, well, what is happening with unauthorized immigration? How many people have crossed illegally over the border? And we're leveraging a 2018 estimate. So um, Mm -hmm. you can imagine from Steve Ballmer's perspective, like if he was trying to run Microsoft using six year dated information about how the business was doing, like that would seem insane, let alone not yeah, having right. like today's numbers. <laughs> and so there's definitely a gap there. So as I, yeah, as I mentioned, we provide the latest information that's available from the government, but in some cases it's quite dated. And, you know, I think, you know, when people think about immigration and, and the policy, one thing we do think it's important to think about too is our population growth and how, you know, who's taking, who is working in, in jobs in this country and and what percent of our population is from from immigration and is that you know people should just look at the numbers and and decide for themselves but I think if you think about overall like overall well, what percent of our population in America um, are immigrants or about about 13.9 percent of our population in the U.S. based on 2022 numbers were foreign born and that's about 46.2 million uh, people. And so the the foreign born share of our population has risen from a low of 4.7% in, in 1970 to, as I mentioned, 13.9% today. So there is a higher percent of, of foreign born people in this country. And they also are a significant part of our labor force, especially filling jobs in construction, where about one in in four jobs in construction are filled by foreign born workers and healthcare. It's the it's not it's not the largest percent, but it is the largest sheer number of people um, who are serving in those in in healthcare in healthcare jobs. Totally. And also just thinking about like the comparison number from like the 70s, like that rise to me, like makes sense. Like if it weren't mm. increasing by that amount, I'd be like, okay, like what's going on? I would almost mm. be shocked. Be like looking True. at a home value, being like, "Oh my god, I bought that house for sixty thousand dollars in nineteen seventy, and then not thinking yeah. like, "Oh, well, now it's worth five hundred k." Like, of course, like thinking of like all the other you know factors involved. So it's just interesting to sort of see where we're at with immigration to you know the best of obviously available numbers and knowledge and all of those things because I do feel like it's been this issue where people are just they're taking their paintbrushes and they're getting creative. We've got like abstract everything happening and it's really hard to sort of figure like what's a game, what's happening versus like what's the reality and I think too like for example like I don't live near a border like that's you know just not my like lived experience. So then when you're just like hearing all of these media narratives and not actually there, you're like, okay, well, I, I don't have anything to visually cue to, you know, I can't just right. like walk to the town next door and be like, oh, wow. Okay. This is a problem or no, this isn't a problem. And so I think we see that in so many different comparisons and places. And I was watching this little like interview with a voter from Michigan and the voter was like asked like, oh, like who did you vote for? And the man said Trump. And then the question was like, oh, like, what was the reason that you, you know, cast that vote? And he was like, the the border, hands down the border. And then the person asked the follow-up question, like, has the border impacted you at at all? The, you know, border crisis. He was like, no. And so it just was like a very interesting example of like, okay, without actually having the data and the personal experience, like where a media narrative can sort of like put you good or bad and different all the things. And so I think this is a very long way of saying, I think having this data is really important to actually create a moment where someone can, especially if you're not directly experiencing something, to actually get a, a good idea of something, not just believe Joe Schmo in the street, you know? Mm-hmm. And Meanwhile, a lot Michigan people- is a border state, which <laughs> is funny. That is interesting. That is a very good point. <laughs> but of course, yeah, it doesn't, yeah. That's funny. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> and it it's now a geography though. podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we talk about most, the majority of our immigrants are coming from Mexico first and India second. So you could, I can understand why you wouldn't associate like Canada as yeah, exactly. a place where people are immigrating, although people are certainly immigrating from Canada. They're not, not at the top of the list. Yeah, totally. Mm-hmm. 
Well, for those who want to watch the State of the Union, what would you advise viewers to really watch out for and would definitely love to get the run through again of how to follow along with your guys's fact checking and all of that? Thank you. Yes. So I would recommend watch the State of the Union. I actually was super proud because when I lived in D.C., I took my daughter's Girl Scout troop to the Capitol and they were setting up, just happened to be setting up for the State of the Union. And I told them, oh, they're setting up for the State of the Union and it's this important address and the president gives it. And I got, you know, I got emails from parents and said, what have you done to my daughter? (laughs) They're eight years old. She's like, she's asking to watch the State of the Union. And I'm like, oh my gosh. That's Winning. so cute. And so I do think it's really important for people to watch it and hear from the president's perspective, what is the, the state of our country? And I know that people are going to want to say, OK, that's the president's perspective. And then they're going to hear from somebody in the Republican Party after who will have, have a different perspective. Mm-hmm. And I would encourage them to go to I mean, I'm biased, but I, I, I'm biased for the facts. I'm biased for USA facts. So <laughs> USAFacts.org, I would go there and go to State of the Union and look at the numbers alongside the topics that are being addressed. Or if you're like, oh, that's that's too much for me. I'm just going to have my phone and and you can certainly see it on your phone, but the, the charts will be pretty small. So you can also mm-hmm. uh, follow us on Instagram or TikTok and we will be live sharing Here's relevant data associated with what's being discussed right now. Um, also, following the State of the Union, we'll publish a series of articles sharing, okay, here's what you know the president said specifically. Here's how the data maps up to that. Here's what we've seen over time and what has changed. So hopefully, usafacts.org can be just a, a source for the facts and the data alongside the issues that are being discussed. Yes. Yes. Well, Safe to say, you know what we'll be doing on State of the Union Night, which is looking at mm-hmm. all these charts, comparing, contrasting, all of the things. But thank you so much for coming on and walking us through all of the different topics and just data number one. And thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Sammy and Maddie. This was so much fun. Thank, thank you. Much.